put like like it. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the rest of our country. Shut up. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. I don't ask for much in life, but if I could get a decent co-host again, I would love it. <laughs> we have all the good co-hosts gone. Uh, <laughs> all right, welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is episode 359, I think? Yeah. 360? I need to really like start writing this part down. Producer Paul. Recorded on July 2nd, 2019, we're going to be talking about the, uh, basically, prisoners' rights more than immigration, but uh, the crisis at the border. So stay tuned. I've got Harry. I've got Reinhold. I've got Paul Copeland. I'll explain who he is later. We've got Hody. Hody Johns, the one and only, uh, who calls me in the mountain. So that'll be right after these words. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads with people before political parties and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Man, I am tired already. We have done already like two hours. Uh, we did the Wall Daily 100. Uh, if you did not listen to the end of that, we are ending the dailies. We're not ending the series. We're going to move it to a new feed. And we're going to call it something else. Uh, but uh, probably libertarian politics and policy. Because uh, that's kind of the tenor of the show. A little bit of history thrown in. And a little bit of history and religion thrown in there. Just a wide range of subjects that you've come to expect from We Are Libertarians and the dailies themselves. But you, you fans of the main show will be getting your feedback. I know some of you are probably upset about that. That you've had your feed stolen by all these pretenders to the throne but uh the commies the commies like dennis or reinhold excuse me i have to dead name him at least one time yeah. uh but uh, so we we celebrated the 100th daily the final daily uh in this feed in last episode and bitched about the libertarian party it was great i was worked up you should definitely listen to that it was a lot of fun uh, we've been recording bonus content for the patreon you're gonna get an extra 30 minutes this week of the shows an extra I think our last week so make sure you join the patreon at five dollars a month and above with me on this episode is uh harry price how are you going good i'm on my, my third cup of coffee and i forgot your name i literally looked at harry and i went what the fuck is his name <laughs> i'm tired man it's because you think we all look alike is that why nerds yes yeah. yeah. Just other, <laughs> listen here, IT guy. <laughs> Forget your name. Uh, the lovely Harry Price. Next to him is Reinhold. Reinhold, how are you? I'm doing well. All right. Uh, looking beautiful in your um, Goonies t shirt with the Truffle Shuffle t shirt covered with a pineapple Hawaiian shirt. Mm -hmm. You could not look more like a libertarian if you tried. I'm trying. That's what I'm trying. I'm trying to re-embrace my hippie roots. Okay. All right. I'm sure everybody's glad to hear that. He looks uh, like the uh, Chinese knockoff of uh, the doctor from Jurassic Park. He, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a poor man's Dr. Moreau. <laughs> uh, uh, that is the voice of Paul Copeland, who you may have occasionally heard on the Wall Dailies. Paul, how are you? I'm doing great. Great to be here, Chris. Are you doing great? Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, unlike three hours ago, uh, I'm not going to be spouting off how depressed I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's depressed, Hody. Hody, he's real depressed. He is like the anti-Hody who is always happy. Yeah, I didn't know uh, Miss Pat was in studio today. Oh, that is Harry. Never mind. But it's just... Mm. Are you yeah, saying they all sound on, alike? People yeah. on podcasts all look the same. Right. <laughs> that is the voice of Hody Johns, the uh, Mormon Mirage, the... Uh, the uh, that's your new nickname the mormon mirage i love that i was gonna go with storm and mormon but there's a few like athletes that have that the mormon mirage Ooh. the polygamous pyramid 
I don't know. I'm Honey, just, the, oh, the Honey Johns. Honey Johns, Johns yeah. yes. It sounds like a ham, a sliced ham that you'd get for deli. <laughs> Papa Honey John. Honey John's deli beef. <laughs> Uh, so we are going to be talking, uh, we've talked a lot. So if you want the fun stuff, you're going to have to go listen to wall 100 wall daily 100 or get our bonus content. Uh, cause we've got a very important subject. I have, uh, I wanted to do this last week because it would have been more timely, but I was too pissed off and I want to think clearly when I give you this information, um, we're going to talk about the crisis at the border and what's happening in the detention centers. And I'm going to make this very clear up front. This is not about immigration. This episode is not about immigration at all. We're not going to talk about whether you're closed borders or open borders. We're not really even going to go into all of the ins and outs of why people are being detained. Uh, you can go to the show notes and you can grab a link to episode 294, I think it is where it was almost a year ago where Harry and I did a full three hour episode on the crisis at the border. We gave you every legal argument we did. We used 250 sources for that particular episode to really find out what is happening. Why is it happening? What's the truth? And you know, the sources on that particular post and in that episode are very detailed and they stand up to the test of time. Uh, there, there is, there is change in what's happened since a year ago. Uh, the The change is essentially that Trump is Trump is doing a couple different things. Trump is uh, he's changed how asylum works. Uh, a lot of this stuff, from a policy, a policy perspective, sitting in his office, would have made complete sense to Trump and and Stephen Miller. Is that his name? Uh, the the little nerdy guy who's kind of the last one left from the original campaign. Uh, from So he's the immigration guy. And so what he's doing is he's, he's detaining, he's basically closed a lot of the ports of entry. If you come and you claim asylum, what used to happen under most presidents, uh, really all presidents, is that you would claim asylum, that you need to be held safely within the borders of the United States, and then you would be given a court date and then you'd be released into the United States and then you'd be told to show up for your court date. The problem was 90% of people literally didn't show up for the court dates. Like 47%. Maybe, okay. Not 90. I've heard 90 from conservative sources. Uh, we'll say 47 from Vox that, that Dennis reads only. I actually well, heard that from the Chad Denson show the other day. So. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry, here it is probably like 47%. It has dropped a little bit because of the fear of deportation, but you know, that's yeah. about it. So, and what, and really, he's closed a lot of ports of entry, so you can't even make an illegal claim for asylum, which just increases the amount of people that try to come in. And what he's also done is given the Border Patrol officers the power to deny a claim outright right. at the border before they get in and, and get their due process. So he's, he's, for all you people who are pissed off about executive power under Obama, here we are. Um, and so he's reinterpreting. So when you pass a law, you can interpret laws in a multitude of ways. So all these people who claim rule of law, like there's always different ways to interpret laws. And so what he is doing is interpreting immigration laws in the absolute strictest sense of the way that they're to be interpreted. One, for instance, is that um, instead of waiting in America, you are sent to Mexico to await your asylum claim court date here in America. And so that is why a lot of people are being detained and held in centers is that they're waiting to be sent back to Mexico. Now, in the past month, since he started the tariff fight with Mexico saying, clean up your borders, and everybody's going, see it work, see it work. The problem is that he freaked everybody who's in Mexico out. And so you have these massive amounts of people who are rushing the borders. And that's why the influx of new immigrants have hit uh, the border. And so those are just kind of some of the different policy things that have happened. What we really want to talk to uh, you about this evening is the conditions inside the detention centers. Uh, I, I get looking at, and many of you who claim, I, uh, I just support following the law. I understand that you're busy and you have lives and many of you may not be able to cite a single law 
<laughs> or, or, well, you may grasp onto like the Flores decision, which ironically is the thing that is really um, going to hoist Trump by his petard in a lot of this stuff because he's violating it. Um, I, I get like going, all right, I understand that 90% of people don't come back and we've got to do something different. I understand that. What I don't understand is that if you're sitting in the Oval Office and you know you're going to make these changes, you don't prepare for it. You're going to increase demand and keep supply the same. Like a basic economics course would have told Donald Trump that if you're going to put 300 people into a detention facility that is staffed for 100, bad things are going to happen. You don't increase funding. You can increase funding for the wall and declare an emergency, a military emergency, a national security emergency for the wall, divert $5 billion for that, but you can't prepare for the influx of people that you're about to detain. What I really want to talk tonight about is prisoner rights. And when the United States holds someone in prison, be it foreign or, foreign or domestic, what rights does that person have? What I have been grieved by and greatly troubled by are the people who I'll give the benefit of the doubt of the people that never click the link to look at the photos or read the articles or hear any of the subjects. I commend you for actually clicking this link and listening. What I can't forgive are the people who have seen the photographs who do understand what's going on and they just don't care. Be it on uh, racism because they're of a different nationality or color, be it uh, a complete sociopathy, a sociopath, like you're, I don't know the word. If you're a sociopath who genuinely doesn't care about your fellow man, like uh, I got into a fight with a state legislature, legislator here named Jim Lucas in Indiana because he had seen it. He just didn't care. Yeah. I mean, and that was the thing too. He called you out because you were saying, whether you agree or disagree on immigration, this isn't right. We need to fix right. this. If this you, is not how we treat people. If you argue that and it's okay, got, you're a sociopath. Yeah. And so people like, you called him a sociopath. I go, I said it's sociopathic to so, argue yeah. that this is okay. The definition of a sociopath is a person with a personality disorder manifesting itself in extreme antisocial attitudes and behavior and a lack of conscience. And, and 4% of the people are sociopaths. So it's you're going to run into a few of them. Mm -hmm. But the, the really irritating thing is, is you weren't calling him out. You were just saying this is wrong. And his response was, this was why libertarians are too extreme. Right. We're too extreme because we think that people, any human being deserves a certain number of inalienable rights. That's what the term means, inalienable. Right. Mm -hmm. As we look at the 4th of July... We're going to see a lot of people who are posting about the new religion, which is militarism, which is honoring the flag because we have a strong military. The, if you want to honor the founders on the 4th of July, read the Declaration of Independence and maybe the Federalist Papers if you want extra credit and understand that natural rights, are, are, all men are created equal doesn't say all Americans are created equal. It says all people are created equal, that certain inalienable rights exist for all human beings. Mm -hmm. It's not about how many people we can kill with drones or by invading other countries. It has nothing to do with the military, the flag, or the pledge. It has everything to do with protecting the rights of the, and the dignity of every individual on the planet. And so when I look at the situation that's happening there, uh, I'm moved by it. I, I, I lean more open borders. I look at, I look at it, frankly, from um, an economic perspective. I try to be consistent as much as I can be. And just as I don't like taxation blocking the free flow of capital between people, I don't like borders blocking the labor uh, where people are trying to go and work or the government is telling me, for instance, I'm going to work in Canada in two weeks. And I had to pay to expedite a passport $300 today to ask permission of the government to leave the country. So they took, they extorted 300 of my hard-earned dollars so that I may please, so it may please the crown that I travel to go earn another paycheck to help pay for the money they extorted from me. Because if I show up to the border and say, can I enter your country? Or worse, if I try to come back, I'm not getting into my own country because I don't have a passport. I haven't paid for the privilege of leaving my own country where I pay taxes. Like, it's sort of absurd. 
it's just sort of an ab- absurd con uh, concept. You know, when I travel between the lines of Indiana and Illinois to work, for instance, uh, not much happens. There is no closed border. There's, you know, I, I think what what bordertarians or people who believe in strong borders or closed borders need to realize is that like you will never stop the free flow of capital or the free flow of speech, you will never be able to stop the free flow of labor. If you have a strong economy in the United States, people will always try to come here to for economic opportunity or to flee situations that are caused by drug wars in their home country. And so the idea that they should just stop coming here is a fantasy. It is as much of a myth as the Green New Deal. And you're really arguing for a, a, a stopping of a, a key component of capitalism, which is a supply of labor. And it's really counterintuitive to a lot of your other beliefs, especially libertarian beliefs. Uh, now, I, uh, you know, from a purely libertarian standpoint, open borders make sense. I do understand the argument that you can't have free health care. Like, look at California. The episode that we did, it was not lost on me that the episode that we did on California last week, where a quarter of the nation of, like, a quarter of their population uh, is, like, it, they have a lot of immigrants. I don't remember the number. I won't put a number on it. And they're there because they get so much free stuff. And so you can't have a welfare state and and just – open your, your floodgates. But that's a completely different argument. That, there's, there's an all-encompassing individualistic argument that needs to be made, and it needs to be made consistently. You disagree that you can have... Uh, no, what I'm saying is, is that we... So on federal level, we say that people who are here illegally aren't um, entitled to welfare for five years, right? Mm-hmm. On the federal level, right. yes. And then right. For so five the, years and after they get a benefit. Right. No, after you are naturalized, you have to wait five years before getting federal welfare. Right. It's the 96, it's the, the Clinton welfare right. reform. That mm-hmm. doesn't count for state and local welfare. Right. So, so what you have now is you have a state who has decided that they're going to do something different. They're going to provide these benefits for everybody who's residing in their state. Right. So why are all these people who claim to be for states' rights wanting a federal level to block California from doing that? I don't know. Let them answer that. I don't I, give I, a shit. Yeah, sense. and that's why, like, usually when I have this type of conversation with someone, and there's like, well, they're citizens. Like, define the word citizen. Define this word because most people is like, well, if you belong in this town, you live in this town, then you are a citizen. And I feel well, that's the definition a lot of the uh, si- the states are going with is like, you are a citizen of the state. You live here. Here's your benefits. We argued a lot of this in that 294 episode. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I uh, we're 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 doing what everybody else does, which is what I don't want to do, which is yeah. getting too far it's into too, immigration. Yeah, we're complaining because right. yeah. it's. It's not right. about immigration. Right. Correct. It's, yeah. it's about how we treat people, prisoners. Yeah. especially prisoners. You have an inalienable right. And I guess what people don't understand is that when you have a right, if we were respecting inalienable rights, we are making sure that we respect. Oh, hold on. Let's just pause there, okay? Mm-hmm. And Hody, you're just going to have to jump in, man, because yeah. that's the problem of having somebody on the on the Zoom and not in the room is that we start we start looking at each other and talking, and and it, and we don't want to. I will. If, if you pop the top on borders, I could go off, but that's not where we're going to go. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm letting you set it up. Go ahead and finish setting it up. I think, I think two things can be true, to use the Ben Shapiroism. You can be for Trump's immigration policy, and you can be disgusted with what is happening. There are a lot of Republican congressmen who are coming around to this way of thinking. Uh, I have not listened to Glenn Beck, but Glenn Beck, when Barack Obama did this, created this drive for teddy bears and took them down and took them to the detainees. You know, uh, the, you can be for prisoners rights and think that these people should be prisoners who are detained and still think that they should have a toilet. Uh, if you don't think that they should be prisoners, I understand that, but let's not confuse the issue with immigration. Let's get these kids. It's, you're not changing the president tomorrow. Let's argue the point that everybody can agree with. If we stay focused which is, this is a problem. And so I want to play a series of audio. And, th- and so we're going to play a lot of clips. And if anybody wants to chime in and say something, just yell and I'll, I'll hit pause. Um, but the first clip is from Democracy Now!, which is an AP report. Uh, the Democracy Now! is like a left-leaning uh, news outlet. It has a lot of 
uncovered stuff from a, from a progressive kind of Glenn Greenwald intercept point of view. And uh, they did a report today about the AP's report, which you'll hear in this clip. NBC News is reporting a federal watchdog warned in May that border agents armed themselves and feared possible riots due to the conditions at an El Paso, Texas immigration detention facility. The Associated Press has released a video showing a 12-year-old girl speaking to a lawyer about her and her six-year-old sister's experience at the Border Patrol Station in Clint, Texas, which has been called a child jail. The two young girls were taken to the jail after being separated from their aunt when they arrived in the U.S. in May. The Clint Border Patrol Station recently came under intense scrutiny after reports of widespread neglect and inhumane living conditions, including lack of food, water, sanitation, and medical care. This is an excerpt of the little girl from the AP video. They gave us little food. Some children did not bathe. They didn't bathe them. They treated us badly where we were. They were mean to us. Where did you sleep? Did you sleep on beds? They slept on just the floor. Did they give you blankets or not? They would only give us one blanket. And was it enough to withstand the cold? No. No, some children were sick. They said that they'd take them to hospitals, but they wouldn't take them. The young girl also told the lawyer children would cry out for their parents and other separated family members. All right. So uh, this is just in Joaquin, Joaquin Castro, a congressman whose brother is running for president, um, actually secretly cr recorded uh, the El Paso border station number one. And you see you can see video of women kind of in that same situation. They do have some of them have sleeping bags and uh, 50, they, some were held for 50 days. They've been denied showers for up to 15 days and life saving medication. So you can go and look at his Twitter to see that particular footage. That was a firsthand account from a little girl who looks like she's somewhere between 7 and 11, I would say. Um, but one of the more heartbreaking testimonies has come from the people who are lawyers and doctors who have been in some of these facilities. Now, the, the main one that kind of has come up is uh, there were some lawyers who went to uh, the Clint, Texas facility and they are there to represent the Flores decision, which we discussed in 294, which is basically some families of migrants were held in detention and, and treated in this way. And they sued the federal government and won in 97. And it outlined a certain set of rights that every immigrant detained was, uh, was uh, supposed to have. And so what these lawyers do is they go and check compliance. Uh, the most shocking i'll save it I'll, I'll point it out once once we hear it but this is one of the lawyers this was on wbur on the on point podcast about a week ago where they were actually uh in the facility trying to see if there was some compliance with the flores decision and this is a first-hand account you'll hear the host begin. Well, joining us now from New York is Elora Mukherjee. She is the director of the Immigrant Rights Clinic at Columbia Law School. Do, do you believe that the that CBP moved these children yesterday uh, as a response? Or uh, it, Now, the New York Times basically did a firsthand account of this lawyer and others who had been in the shelter at the Clint, Texas facility. The next day, they were moved from the Clint, Texas facility. Now, if I were a good government bureaucrat, I'd say, well, after the report, we were troubled by this. So we moved them all for cleaning, to, for, to clean the facility properly. And so when we resettle them back in this facility, it will be taken care of. The more cynical view is that we just don't want you to get any footage of these kids in these particular conditions. And so you don't actually see what's going on. And therefore, the eyewitness testimony isn't corroborated. An action in response to you and several members of the legal team who went public uh, late last week to what you what you told the world that you saw. Yes, the conditions were the most degrading and inhumane conditions I have ever seen. And I have been representing asylum seeking children and their families in detention facilities since 2007. 
this is unacceptable and should not be happening in America. When we arrived at the facility in Clint on Monday morning, we were told that there were more than 350 children detained there. It is a facility that is designed for adults and has a capacity just over 100. We were told on Tuesday morning that about 100, and chil uh, that about 100 children had been transferred out. And then on Wednesday morning, we were told the same thing. And it is critically important important for the American public to understand what is happening in our name. The government knew you were coming, though, right? Listen to this. They had a warning, and you are hearing what this woman saw. They had warning, and they said they cleaned up. And the, this was the most stunning fact that I had heard. I knew for several weeks that, uh, that several the, this weeks. team of attorneys and, and interpreters and medical professionals were coming as part of continued monitoring uh, of Flores. That's correct. The government had three weeks notice that we planned to visit Clint and the on the ground staff guards at Clint knew we were coming a week in advance. And as a result, they cleaned up the facility before we arrived, some children bathed for the first time while we were there last week. Some children who had been held incommunicado without a single opportunity to make a phone call since crossing the border were allowed their first phone calls. But even with that, though, what we, what's been reported, what you and your... Basically, what they couldn't clean up was the memory of the children that were being held there. And when they were asked how they were doing, they told the truth instead of looking at the facility. Your uh, legal colleagues have been saying over the past several days is shocking. I mean, can you just tell us more in detail about what you saw? One of your colleagues uh, has told a couple of news outlets that, for example, uh, when interviewing uh, a young ch uh, a child who was being told to take care of another child, the, in the infant had no diapers and was sitting there and in the process of the conversation of the interview, because the the child had no had, had inadequate clothing, just urinated right where where the child was sitting. I want you to think about the morality of the situation. If you were watching a, a, a an episode of SVU, and you heard the torture facility that where a child was being held and a, one child was taking care of another, and the baby didn't have diapers, and this was a company that uh, was housing children, foster children here in America and they were living in these conditions, this would be an episode of SVU. So why does the morality change when we go from a perpetrator on the SVU show to the federal government? It doesn't. In fact, the morality is more outrageous because your tax dollars are being stolen to treat children this way. That's true. We saw children who were hungry, who were dirty, who were sick, and who were terrified and who have been detained for days and weeks and some nearly a month. The children consistently reported that they did not have enough food to eat. The ration of food given to the children is the same. Everyone gets the same tray, regardless of if they're one years old or 17 year old, regardless of if they're a breastfeeding mother who needs additional calories. The children were dirty. Most of them had not showered since crossing the border. The overwhelming majority of them were wearing the same clothing that they crossed the border in. So their clothes were stained in bodily fluids, nasal mucus, urine, breast milk for the teenage moms who are breastfeeding. And when I interview children, in immigration detention, I typically try to sit close to them so that I can try to build some rapport while we're talking about the most sensitive and traumatic topics possible. And I found that hard to do with some of the children last week because there was a stench in the facility. The children have no access to soap, to wash their hands. Most of them had not brushed their teeth once since crossing the border. The few who had opportunities to brush their teeth did so for the first time last week. We're... Uh hearing that there are influenza and lice outbreaks in the facility. I just want to say, I edited out a very long pause where the host of the show tried to catch herself so she didn't cry. 
as many of you are probably feeling that lump in your throat right now, because these are humans. These are children. These are the most vulnerable people on the planet. These are refugees from areas of the country where the American drug war has ripped their country into tatters. And they fled here to be safe. And then they got here to the land where they'd be safe from monsters who torture them and ended up in these facilities. And so that's why there, there was a long pause that I just wanted to point out. It's because to hear this story and to think about children, you have to deny their humanity. To think that these aren't people with feelings and emotions to think that this is okay. You have to literally deny their humanity Well, it's... and say they shouldn't have come here. Well, they're here and they're in your care. You are a ward of the state. If your child was in an American detention facility in these conditions, as a parent, how would you feel? That feeling doesn't change just because this child is Honduran. And it's sociopathic to think that it does. I'm sorry. It makes you lack a conscience if you think that that particular scene is okay because they're of a different nationality. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I mean, this is just the Stanford prison experiment illustrated in real life with real results. Mm -hmm. Which was what? Uh, was what, the mid-60s where uh, Stanford College did a experiment where they put one group of students in charge of running a prison uh, facility with other students as the subject, and they gave them authority to set rules and uh, to divvy up the resources. And what you found is eventually the uh, students with power dehumanized and began to mistreat the uh, students that were being held as... Uh, I had heard that that had been debunked somehow. So I, something in my brain says that that particular experiment was debunked. The, so double, double check that if you actually, before you share that, just well, do your homework on that. No, no, that's, that's real. Uh, Philip Zimbardo, the guy who did it, he wrote a whole book on it. I just finished reading it. Oh. Uh, yeah. In fact, there's footage available online too. Okay. Um, well, I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, give us more details, Hody, since you just read this book. Man. So uh, with Dakota yeah. Davis, uh, he, he, we both read, um, uh, the Lucifer effect is what it's called. And it's by this guy, Philip Zimbardo, who ran the uh, Stanford prison experiment. And he borrowed from some older tactics where uh, it was, a, it was based on authority. Uh, what they're trying to show is what somebody with a badge can do. Somebody without a badge can do. So somebody with street clothes would come up to someone and say, Hey, we're going to do this experiment where we shock this puppy. And they're going to be like, heck no. But then somebody in a science jacket with like a little license and a form is like, hey, we're going to shock this puppy to, you know, we got to do it for, and they're like, well, if it's for science, ah, oh, okay. You've got a badge, you've got a coat, you've got a uniform. In the case of the Stanford prison experiment, you've got a badge. So therefore you'll obey my authority. Now, the funny thing about the Stanford, well, I guess not funny, the horrifying thing about the Stanford prison experiment is you had these fellow kids who knew they weren't in charge, but they were placed in there. They were given, a, uh, they gave them all a baton, didn't, tell any of them that they could even use them, but almost all of them used it in like threatening ways. Uh, even if not to hit, to like rattle it against the cells and all of them just love the feeling of authority. So basically they dress up as authority of figures, they get treated like authority and they become authority, even though they aren't even granted any authority. Uh, it's just, it, it, I mean, it was nightmarish. I think Paul summarized it well. It gets into a lot of, there was a many, there was multiple different psychological, it was a personality experiment as well. Yeah, but a lot of different elements. It, it got so out of hand that they actually had to cut the experiment short. And, uh, and now we have the same thing playing out, but with real authority, with limited resources, because it's run by the government. And the nature, not... Just watch Chernobyl. Uh, the nature of bureaucracy is that it moves slowly. It doesn't it doesn't react to events quickly. And so what you have is a group of border agents. Let's just assume, let's give the benefit of the doubt that the people that work in these facilities are decent people who show up to work every day, who care deeply about these kids and just want to take care of them, but they have no ability 
to actually get from their supervisors increased resources because Congress and the Trump administration won't release funding. Now, Congress did pass a $4.5 billion relief package last Tuesday. We were here as, we, as it came through. Um, but it, it, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's a lack of resources. And so anytime you're asking the government to solve a problem and conservatives are asking the government to solve a problem, human lives are actually hurt by public policy and that's the best case scenario where it is just a matter of a lack of resources you right. throw in from the very top the head of our entire government the, ha has led a campaign for the past three years of dehumanizing people seeking asylum yeah the mm -hmm. command climate as jacob the command climate as one of our contributors has talked about in the military, for instance, is that you, you the person at the top really does affect the way that the military works. Um, and so in this situation, and there was just an article recently um, where there was a study of these immigration, the, the ICE officers and the border patrol agents and the people that work in these facilities, they're in a bunch of Facebook groups and it was basically mocking the conditions of the children, mocking the, the photo of the dead dad and son laying in the, in the water face down, mocking a Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, like saying some really indefensible things. Did you see her response to that? Yeah, I heard it, but uh, I don't really talk about her. So, <laughs> um, so let's continue on with uh, the attorney that uh, witnessed what was going on inside the facility. He's as well, uh, and that at least in one case, children were told after being given some lice shampoo to share. A so that's actually a good lead in. Let's just assume that they're all good uh, agents, that these people actually care for the children. They're just lacking resources. Let's see if what has been happening in the facility holds up according to this particular interview. Removing comb and they were punished when one of those combs were lost? That's exactly right. So about 20 girls are, were held in one of these cages, one of these holding cells, and two of the girls had lice and the guards gave them two knit combs so that they could comb out the hair, not just of those two girls, but they were ordered to share those two combs and comb out the hair of all 20 girls. Now, this is exactly the opposite of what you're supposed to do when a person has lice. They are not supposed to share their combs with anyone, but the girls were told that they all had to share those same two combs. In the process, the girls lost one of the combs. When the guards found out, they were enraged and the guards ordered the girls to find the combs and said that if the comb was not found, the girls would lose their very thin blankets and the mats that they sleep on. And that is in fact what happened. The kids could not find that comb and the blankets um, the limited blankets and mats that were in that cell were taken out. All the girls had to sleep on the concrete floor that night. And we repeatedly heard from children that there are not sufficient beds or mats for children to sleep on and that they are sleeping on concrete floors. Even in the holding cells where there seem to be bunk beds, the children are reluctant to sleep there because the temperatures are so cold. And children told me that if you sleep on the beds, you are freezing cold at night. And as a result, a number of the children try to huddle together on the floor to stay warm. Now, when they say blankets, the blankets are actually those foil wrappers that you get after you run a marathon. Or mylar emergency blankets. Right. Yeah. They're emergency blankets that you'd use if you were trapped on the interstate for three hours. They're not blankets. No, they're there to hold just enough body heat to keep you right. from catching hypothermia. Now, the, yeah. the congressman that shared that video, those women had sleeping bags. But as you can imagine, this, these are emergency detention facilities that are meant to hold people for 72 hours. And they're holding some of these people for three or four weeks, if not longer. Harry, go ahead. No, I'm just, sorry. I, I, I thought I was ready to like listen to all this again and go through all this, but like this is yeah, it's still very disturbing. Well, you may say to yourself, okay, this is a lawyer who is representing the Flores decision. They must be some crazy activist. I want to play for you 
an eyewitness um, uh, from, from a doctor who works for a charity who goes in now. People actually, by the way, tried to donate soap and all kinds of things, and mm-hmm. they were not allowed to. You're not allowed to send anything. Right. Um, so this is a doctor who works for a charity that, that has been going and caring for some of the children. Uh, and let's hear what she has to say. It's from the same WBUR On Point uh, podcast radio interview that I listened to. I want to hear now from Dr. Dolly Lucio Sevier. Dr. Sevier is a pediatrician in Brownsville, Texas. She was asked by lawyers to visit the Ursula Detention Facility in McAllen, Texas. Now, this is a separate facility from Clint. This is a different facility than the one that the woman just uh, now. And what you will find as you look into this, you will see images and video and articles from eyewitnesses from multiple different facilities. And they're all going through the same thing. And so some of you may say, well, this, those people probably have not made it this far in the episode or even listened at all, but, uh, well, that's just one facility. This is a systemic problem. This is a problem with the way that your government is operating its facilities. And so this is a com- an eyewitness from a completely different location. After a flu outbreak there, sent at least five infants to the hospital. Infants. Dr. Severe visited on June 15th. She wrote up a medical declaration that was later obtained by ABC News. And in- Now, she did not go public like the last people. She wrote up a document that was obtained by an, a news organization. So she was not seeking publicity right. with this account. So that dec- this was a report to the managers of the facility. Right. Dr. Severe said, quote, the conditions within which the children are held could be compared to torture facilities. Well, we spoke with Dr. Severe a little bit earlier. And that's sort of the weird thing about all this is that, you know, Ocasio-Cortez says, oh, these are concentration camps, which you could see as, you know, the, you could see that as hyperbole. But she was drawing something of that from her memory of what could compare to this, because a lot of people say she's this young congressman and yes she is and it's like what is like has she experienced or most americans experienced of seeing anything like this right and people that's who, what they're going to think of people who don't know history tend to kind of leap to the thing that they most but let's go to the definition of concentration camp just mm-hmm. as we did with sociopath sociopath a place where large numbers of people especially political prisoners or members of a persecuted minority are deliberately imprisoned in a relatively small area with inadequate facilities sometimes to provide forced labor or to await mass execution. All right, we missed the mark on those last two. Uh, so, For right now. <laughs> well, I don't think anybody's trying to... Forced labor part. Or the execution part, but it fits the definition of a relatively small area with inadequate facilities who are deliberately imprisoned. Well, oh, wait a minute. The forced labor part, they did for trying to ask the lady to go comb out the other lice. I mean, spread lice with the two combs. Yeah. How did Anne Frank die? Anybody look that she, up? She died in a... In a she died in a... Right. But that's the other thing, too. Anne that, Frank died of typhus, typhus. Right. Yeah. because it was spread by fleas. Right. right. What people don't understand when they, they get upset about the term concentration camp and they immediately think death camps. Now, right. there were concentration camps and there were death camps uh, during World War II. There was a distinction between the World two. World War I had German concentration mm-hmm. camps in America. Well, we had, yeah, we had... In World War II, we had a you know, the Japanese the, internment. Yeah, that wasn't so a, that, that, and those, FDR called them concentration camps. Those facilities are far above what these are. Well, I mean, we so as libertarians and Republicans, we keep hearing, "Well, FDR ran concentration camps. We're using the same facilities as we were in the 1930s. They're literally housing immigrants there." Yeah, there was a protest on. At one of the facilities, it was the facility where they, the Japanese were being held. And there was people who lived in that concentration camp were there um, protesting most, with, with so, everybody. Yeah, so if, so if they were concentration camps under FDR, but now under Papa Trump, they're not, you can get fucked. No, here's the, here's the, my problem with that argument. And, and that's what the state legislator tried to use on me. Well, Obama did it. And I just said... So I thought everything Obama did was wrong. So the, the, the idea of, well, Obama did it belies that you think that there's a moral impropriety there. 
it, it basically says that you think something is wrong, but the other side did it, so you're okay with it, and it gives you permission to do the same behavior, or you're agreeing with Barack Obama. Either way, I don't think you, Mr. Trump, supporting the state legislator, want to make either of those claims. It's such a poor argument, the whataboutism of all mm -hmm. this. Uh, so let's go back to the interview. Let's listen to this eyewitness um, who is the doctor who's treating a lot of these infants with their sickness. At least five infants to the hospital. Dr. Severe visited on June 15th. She wrote up a medical declaration that was later obtained by ABC News. My point was, oh, going back to it, is that the hyperbole, hyperbole of a torture facility, she defines it in the end, and I really want you to hear it because see if you agree with the hyperbole. And that's the problem with using hyperbole like AOC does or Trump does or other people use hyperbole all the time to get your attention. But when there's something that really does need your attention because it does fit the, hyper the hype, people don't pay attention because they're so exhausted by you. Uh, and this is one instance where I think torture facility really does fit this definition. In that declaration, Dr. Severe said, quote, the conditions within which the children are held could be compared to torture facilities. Well, we spoke with Dr. Severe a little bit earlier today, and we began by asking her to describe the things that she saw that will stay with her the most. Definitely what impacted me the most was the inability of the mothers to wash their infant's formula bottles. I think what I think over and over after seeing that was if a parent told me that. And Harry, you just made a face. You are the parent of someone who uses a bottle. Not washing a bottle after every use. What is that? What does that that's mean? Just bacteria. That is, oh man, that's just, that's got to smell awful. Um, just, just the smell, but the bacteria in there, because the, you know, it is where that milk is, right? And you put human saliva in there. It is just an incubator. It's just, oh wow, that is disgusting. Exam room. I'd be very concerned about their conditions at home, and consider she, calling. She said, "I would consider calling CPS if this were in my exam room at my home clinic." Yes, to get them some support. Um, that that was what was most alarming to me. So, uh, not being able to even rinse the bottles out after be using them for days and days. They rinse with water that's supposed to be used for drinking um, in in a in a bathroom sink that does not have running water, it, and they have no soap. So they're being rinsed. Yes. Okay, you were able to uh, interview or see almost forty children. How many of them were sick? Two-thirds of them were sick. Um, many of those had recently had contracted influenza specifically, but about two-thirds had respiratory illnesses. You've also said and written that you feel that the sanitary or unsanitary conditions at the processing center, the fact that children couldn't wash their hands or brush their teeth, amounted to an intentional spreading of disease? They're clearly having issues with outbreaks. They've reported it themselves. They've closed some centers because of that. And I think it's pretty clear human understanding that washing your hands reduces spread of infection. I asked several mothers if there was any hand sanitizer around specifically when they were all denying soap and water. And I pointed to my hand sanitizer I brought along and they said, yeah, those are for the guards. Now you've been widely quoted. Many of the guards, don't worry, many of the guards are wearing face masks with ventilation. Uh, so they're protected. What that, what that doctor just said is that no person could be in this facility and deny that washing your hands or cleaning a bottle is what needs to take place. And so therefore, in her opinion, it is intentional. The guards are intentionally trying to get these children sick. Uh, once your medical affidavit made it out to the media as saying that what you saw were conditions within which could be compared to torture facilities. Why did you say yeah. that? I believe there are a lot of ways that you can torture a human and definitely demoralizing their spirit by not allowing them to keep clean, keeping them uncomfortably cold for weeks, keeping the lights on 24 hours in a warehouse, keeping them inside of a cage for weeks. Uh, yes, I believe all of that can really get into a person's psyche and torture them emotionally. Um, which is no less than physical torture, in my opinion. Have you ever seen anything like this in your practice so far? No, not like this. How old was the youngest child that you saw? Two and a half months. 
I've been born in Mexico on mom's way here. Two and a half months. Two and a half months old, yes. Did any of the children uh, show signs of psychological harm or trauma? And do you, are you concerned that that trauma could last? Yes, I think all of the children had signs of trauma, every single one. All of them? Every single one of them? I mean, I, I see kids all day long and, you know, an 18-month-old should not want you to examine them and they should scream and pull away and go to their mother. And, you know, a two-year-old should be a little bit fearful and then willing to talk. But they were all inappropriately subdued. I mean, they, they clearly were very fearful of me, but completely let me do my entire physical exam without any fight, which was entirely inappropriate for their age and stage of behavior. The infants without their parents of course, were obviously far worse. You know, they were, um, they came with daycare workers um, that were in the facility that they were, had become attached to, but they repeated the same statements. Two of the girls interviewed at different times said, my dad's getting the papers, my dad's getting the papers, my dad's getting the papers over and over. Almost when I asked any questions, that's what they responded. There was another child who was also without any parent who was just panting the entire time I saw him. And I asked the daycare worker, has he been sick? He said, no, he just started doing this when he came. But of course, it was just a, another more high stressful situation. So, um, and yes, yes, I believe they're being traumatized and will suffer lasting damage. Also in your, uh, in your report, you said that you respectfully submit that no child should be held in these facilities for even se- even 72 hours, even though that's what's uh, allowed by the law. So what, I mean, you want them to get out of there, but what is it that you think should be done Im- immediately right now or next steps? I think to be done realistically immediately to help their situation is that they could appoint a physician at some of these facilities who's there specifically for the well-being of the children. I believe that any physician would see that these children need soap, the bottles need to be washed. I'm I'm not asking for perfection, but there are a lot of very small, non-expensive things that can be done to make the conditions better in these facilities. Um, The lights could be dimmed at night instead of all the way off. You know, there are children who really are separated from their parents um, without even teen parents that are toddlers um, that could be better taken care of. They could be expedited a lot more quickly to get out of these places and have priority for ORR. Um, But I think that it's clear that no one is taking the well-being of these children into any sort of priority in the decision making here. You know, no one is taking the well-being of the children into any sort of priority here is what she just said. It just feels like cattle call. It feels like they're animals and we're getting them through. There's no human decency. There's no human dignity. There's nothing, you know, that needs to be considered besides keep them in this space until we put them in another space. Now let's hear what the Trump administration uh, said in court recently. This uh, is from that same WBUR on point interview. Earlier this month, on June 18th, in fact, so just a couple of days ago, uh, in front of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Department of Justice lawyer Sarah Fabian argued before the judicial panel that withholding basic toiletries does not violate the federal government's responsibility to provide, quote, safe and sanitary conditions to detained children. And here here you will uh, listen to DOJ lawyer Sarah Fabian again being questioned by Judge A. Wallace Tashima. It's within everybody's common understanding that, you know, if you don't have a toothbrush, if you don't have soap, if you don't have a blanket, it's not safe and sanitary. Well, wouldn't everybody agree to that? Do you you agree to that? Well, I, I think it's, I think those are, there's fair reason to find that those things may be part of safe and sanitary. No, maybe are a part. What do you say maybe? You mean there are circumstances where a person doesn't need to have a toothbrush, toothpaste, and soap for days? Well, I think in CBP custody, there's frequent, it's frequently intended to be much shorter term. So it may be that for a shorter term stay in CBP custody that some of those things may not be required. You'd die in the wilderness if you didn't have a blanket. You're just dead. Right. Yeah. But your, but your government doesn't give a fuck about that point. <laughs> the government- I'm in restaurant management. They would shut us down in a day if they didn't find if they found out we didn't have access to soap that day. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, they would just be like, oh, is there no soap on your facility? You're done. I mean, they will, they'll write us up and they'll, in fact, once uh, our hot water machine has to hit X amount for all Mm -hmm. the bacteria to die. And it wasn't quite temping that amount. So we had to hand wash all our dishes dishes in order for us to stay open. Same government says, eh, what's a month without a toothbrush? What's a couple weeks with a dirty diaper? No diaper. No, no, like you don't get the diaper. Crap yourself. Like, it's seriously. not. It's Same not, government says this place can operate and you can crap yourself, but I can't serve in your restaurant because I saw one of your employees only wash his hands for thirty seconds instead of a full minute. Dude, fuck off. The, the argument is not whether or not these people should have come here. The argument is, does a child deserve a toilet? Does a child deserve to have a bed? Like. To me, this is so fundamental. Like, let me just finish up with some of the the notes are fantastic. Our show notes are going far beyond what we're discussing here. Um, so Sam Schultz did an amazing job with those. Uh, I may do, uh, you know, a, a Patreon episode just kind of covering some of the stuff that we aren't going to get to in the notes. Um, but, you know, what are the rights of prisoners? If you believe that our, our declaration and the founding applies to the rights of all human beings, that the Constitution is a document that kind of lays out from a natural rights perspective what people deserve, these are just some of the basic prisoner rights. You know, every inmate has the right to be free under the Eighth Amendment. Under the Eighth Amendment, the Universal Declaration of Your Natural Rights in the Bill of Rights, um, Anything that could be considered cruel and unusual punishment is banned. The Eighth Amendment did not clearly define what that would include, but the Supreme Court has held that it would include drawing and quartering, disemboweling, beheading, public dissection, burning alive, sexual harassment, or sex crimes. Uh, There have been hundreds of sexual assaults against children, women, and men in these facilities by the guards not just by the other people in the detention facilities, but the guards themselves. Inmates have a right under the Eighth Amendment to be free from sex crimes or sexual harassment, um, both from inmates or prison personnel. You have a right to complain about prison conditions and access to courts. Inmates have the right to complain about prison conditions and voice their concerns, uh, which is what the Flores decision was about. You have a right to medical and mental health care. Prisoners are entitled to receive medical care and mental health treatment. As with accommodations for, dis- for the disabled, these treatments need only be reasonable or adequate. As a result, if someone has a cavity, they might not be entitled to a filling, for instance, instance but to only having a tooth pulled. Often, even those with life-threatening illnesses like AIDS or various forms of cancer are given only the minimum treatment necessary to keep them reasonably comfort not necessarily to extend their life. We are meeting none of those standards in terms of the health care that is being provided to the prisoners that are on the southern border. You have a First Amendment right. You have the right to exercise any of these rights and, and speak about what's going on. You have a right not to be discriminated against. Um, just as in the outside, inmates have the right to be free from discrimination while imprisoned. This incru- includes racial segregation. Um, What rights inmates do not have. Inmates generally lose their right to privacy. They are not protected from warrantless searches of their cell phone or person, for instance. Um, I mean, to me, guys, now that we've kind of laid out what's happening and kind of explained what's what's going on down there, none of this seems to be a hard question. No. If it, we have a $4.1 trillion budget every year in this country, and we certainly have the ability to take care of the wards that are, are a part of our prison system, and we just can't seem to get a third of our population to give a shit or even to hear what's going on. And it's just very dismaying. Like, this doesn't seem to be a hard question. Children should have health care and toilets, no matter their nationality. Yeah, and I, I would like to directly uh, challenge one of the uh, points that I see a lot of people bring up is uh, that because they're non-citizens, they're not entitled to constitutional protections. But a vast majority of our Constitutional Bill of Rights and all the other amendments since have been incorporated 
and extended to uh, illegal aliens or people in this country that are non-citizens. You remember originally citizens were white male landowners, but the constitution protected the rights, the natural and alienable rights of everybody who lived here. Who lives within the borders. Right. Or who, who, who exists with, we can't, you know, we can't, you know, enforce that onto other countries unless well, we do it by right. force. But there have been rulings that the constitution yeah. applies to human bodies, mm-hmm. regardless of nationality, living when, within the United States. When border. the constitution says citizen, it means citizen. Mm-hmm. When the constitution says people, mm-hmm. it means everybody. Right. Uh, I really think that Gitmo plays a piece in this. Um, Abu Ghraib as well. Abu Ghraib. I, I think I think that the idea that we can just keep people in permanent detention, give them no due process, uh, that keep them in whatever condition that we'd like. Obviously, the get the Gitmo conditions improved, but early on they were very uh, abusive. Mm-hmm. And what the government what the government does is it often carves out what it would like to do to all of us on the on the least. We, we talked about this with free speech. Right. We're going to carve out censorship for the hackers and the sex workers and the conspiracy theorists because we really wanted to do it to all of you. Mm-hmm. And now we're doing it to conservatives and libertarians. And that's what the government does in eroding all of your rights. It picks the people and, the pub, and public opinion does this as well, the people who control public opinion. We're going to do it to the people that you don't want to defend like al-Qaeda terrorists. Mm-hmm. And then eventually it sets a moral precedent because people didn't defend the rights of those people. So what, what I think Gitmo did in this nation, I think a lot of the people on the left that I personally disagreed with at the time, I think they were right. I think that not applying due process to al-Qaeda terrorists, con- con- still detaining these people, treating them in whatever manner we want to treat them, torturing them, on a consistent basis, mm-hmm. it conditioned America to just accept that if you're not from here, we can treat you like you're an animal in a cattle car. Uh, and Americans at this point, 20 years later, just kind of go, eh, they're not Americans because the precedent was set 20 years ago during well, the war. There's still people right. sitting in Gitmo. Right. Uh-huh. right. Yeah, they're still sitting in Gitmo. They haven't had a trial. Yeah. And that's why I was like, well, it's off. We wouldn't do this on our own borders. We wouldn't do this on American soil. It's different. It's over there. Now it's on the border, and now we did it to them. Now, now we can. Now after this, yeah. what's next? In ten years, they're going to start doing this to you know, who, quote unquote, undesirables inside what's the, the country. What's the hundred mile um, constitution free border zone? Right. Yeah. That they gave to themselves. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's another wrinkle that I found kind of interesting that was raised in that interview. Uh, she mentioned that the uh, government is supposed to legally process them through within 72 hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, another right that we have in our Bill of Rights is the right to a speedy and fair trial and a fair hearing before it becomes an undue burden on us being held by the government. Right. Mm -hmm. So the federal government, under the direct orders of President Donald Trump, is violating the right to due process here. And, and not just remember back when everybody's like, well, we, we, we looked at everyone coming in at Ellis Island and we inspected them and made sure that they were, you know, not sick, that they, you know, they come mm-hmm. in and be processed. They were processing, processing 10,000 people a day. Yeah. And the average wait time to be processed was three hours, mm-hmm. not, 16 months or however long it is these yeah. days. You would have ships dock with 20,000 people. They would depart, and within six hours, they would be on a ferry to mainland New York City. Yeah. And this is the internet era, right? We, we, yeah. we have advanced technology to help us make this process faster, right? It, it's, but it's the utilitarian argument. Nothing government does works. The government is in charge of this, therefore it is a failure because bureaucracy will always fail. And so conservatives think that, well, we can just get the government to manage this project. And they can't. They don't know how the government government bureaucracy fails every time. And this is an argument libertarians need to make less of the moral argument and more of the utilitarian argument, but that takes research and facts. 
the government almost always fails at everything it does. And the more you point that out and say, this isn't a solution, this doesn't work, the market will provide, the better, the better off we'll all be because that's more persuasive than this is, this is a clear case where it is immoral. This is a moral outrage. Mm -hmm. There is anger that every single one of us sitting here and probably most of our listeners felt listening to all of that. How dare this country engage in such moral behavior? And, and the worst thing when we're talking about government and how ineffective it is and then politics, when politics gets involved, is that you have these problems come up and people go, well, this is what we should do to fix this and this is what we used to do here, so let's do that there. Nobody's asking the important question is why is this happening to begin with hmm. and actually addressing the root cause of issues. Right. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing that just that simple thing just does not get done. We're, I mean, we're getting into some philosophy and legality here. Are we, are we done telling sad stories or is, is there a couple more that you have for us? Um, I mean, I don't have more sad stories. Okay. I, do, I, I, did, did, well, I did want to say one thing before go you ahead. go is that uh, in, Indiana, right. let's just, what, in Indiana, we don't treat, we, we would go to jail if we treat uh, our pets as bad as these people are being treated. That's exactly right. And that's the point is that, mm. uh, so let me, Hody, before we get off on your rant, I want, I want to just kind of, uh, what do you want to talk about? So I don't cut us off too much. What do you, what are you going to say? What is it? Why are you a libertarian? Think about this for a second. Why are you a libertarian? This is not philosophy for philosophy's sake. I see a lot of libertarians trying to defend. I've gotten more blowback over my condemnation of these border conditions from libertarians than I have about any other subject. Man, and I don't get it. Right. Because if you are a libertarian, why? Why? Band of Brothers had, had a, a series. One of them was called Why We Fight. Man, you don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get it. And then you see a concentration camp. And you say, okay, okay, I, I get it. This is why I've decided to risk my life. If you're a libertarian, why are you investing your time, money, effort, blood, sweat, tears into this? Right? It's not philosophy for philosophy's sake. You're not just putting together some puzzle and just being like, oh, look how conveniently that fits. The, the, same, person, the same person that we'll talk about, and, and usually it's more from the, the Mises, Ron Paul crowd where they're a little more right-leaning, the same person that will talk about how drones are creating new terrorists in Yemen right now doesn't seem to make the connection that these traumatized little children who are in detention facilities in South Texas and New Mexico and other places who will be sent back to their home country. Cre they, we've cre we're creating sociopaths. Mm -hmm. And I know I keep using that word, but when you hear the trauma that these children are going through, not just the journey here, and that's on the parents. I fully understand that. But when you get to America and you get into what you have been told, we're going to America where you will be safe. And then you end up in these facilities. How many of these children are going to go back to Honduras and become terrorists against the United States? I, I, I don't know that they will or not. There's no precedent for that. But I wouldn't be surprised if in 20 years we have a significant problem with terrorism from Central and South America because of what we're doing in these detention facilities. And make no mistake, from episode 294 a year ago to today, the conditions have greatly deteriorated. Was, Harry, was there anything like what we heard earlier like in episode 294 a year ago? Not like this. It was kids in sleeping bags, mm -hmm. and they were in cages, and it was right. traumatic that they were being separated. Mm -hmm. This is now a new level a year later. What will it look like in two years? Right, and they had the glamour shots of all the kids playing in stuff at least. Right. You know, the backdrop, no, there's none of that anymore. The, the drone shots and the images that you see look like worse than the Skid Row photos that you see. Like what, when you see photos of these camps, it looks like worse than a third world country. Skid Row at least had blankets. They had shelter. Okay. Right. There's, there's some there's, running water and toilets. Right. 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 The, the, and the, the conditions of these kids is like, I'd rather take my chances with the desert. Mm -hmm. You know, sorry. Well, no, it's not, and the spending bill that was approved. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a, there was a uh, delay in getting that done because there were two versions of the bill, and the Democrats were holding out for one, and the Republicans were holding out for the other one. Right. The Democrats finally caved because they said, we need to get money to these people. But what their bill had in it was basic um, standards that had to be met by the government for the, for the kids. Right. 
And Trump and the Republicans wanted to veto that because they wanted the other bill that had more folk with no limits or any requirements and more focus on paying uh, overtime to the border patrol agents. Yeah. So I want to, I want to touch before we go on constitutional rights of illegal aliens and what the Supreme court and other courts have ruled over time. What, Harry, what are you, what are you? I'm just fuming like, like, at the <laughs> whole aspect of this thing. It is, the idea of holding them, right, and, like, the money that goes with my, okay, so, like, the logical brain of mine, right, like, once I get through the emotion, uh, which is probably trying to get my uh, mind out of the emotion uh, part of that, because that is a deep hole, and it's, like, really tr- making me shut down. I think but any parent would feel that way. The, uh, the logical part of it is, like, just get them out there and release them, because you could give them an Obama phone or Trump phone. You can call them whatever you want, and if they don't show up their report, just check the phone. Find them. Find them. This makes no sense why we're just why you're just storing these people. We let prisoners go to uh, home detention and they have a little ankle bracelet. Why can't we do that with these? What, 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 this, no, 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 no. Well, they're not no. showing up for their. Let's we'll go get. It's. I don't understand the. De- concept. That's Reinhold, cheaper to guys, go pick them guys, up. Guys, guys, let's start with getting them a toilet and I some don't. running water. Just, let's make this real easy on just people. Let them go. <laughs> yeah, just, let them go. No, no, so, no. Hold no. on. That's too hard for people to accept. Let's just start with. Does a child deserve to shit their pants without diapers at two years old for three months? Do you agree with this or not? Like the idea that we're going to get the Trump crowd after 30 years of, I mean, really, the, the Hody, the book club book that we did, Liber- Liberty's First Crisis, about the first Congress and the Alien and Sedition Acts, the entire thing was about a crackdown on free speech and a crackdown on immigrants. This is born into the DNA of this country. It's a country built on immigrants. And the other people who immigrated 50 years previously hate the new immigrants. The like, no, just, no nothings, the KKK. Right. You know, and then you had right George, George Will wrote a piece like, hey, listen, it used to be worse 100 years ago. Read the book, no, The Golden Gate. The, well, it's The Guardian Gate. Guardian and it's, Gate. It's, that's the book I'm going to try and get everybody to read because right. it is so important to read. And I didn't like necessarily his take on it that, well, it was, it was worse then or whatever. It was just that they were more open about what they were saying, but they were still couching it. If you look at and you read the book, uh, there's a lot of uh, artic- a lot of things taken out of their communications between people that was not public at the time and what they were really saying right. about what they wanted. They want these people. Sort of like when your Facebook so, groups accidentally end up on yeah. BuzzFeed. So, yeah, your private groups. So um, that book is such a great tale of how we got from the know nothings to basically the late 1800s uh, through the through the rise of a eugenics the 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 unions who wanted to make sure that cheap labor weren't coming in and causing mm-hmm. the prices to go down and the Boston Brahmins who were basically the aristocracy of Boston who were upset that 70% of Boston was either immigrant first or second generation they wanted to keep America, America. They wanted to fight for the Nordic tradition. They wanted to keep America was, white, right? Right. It was just like, it, it wasn't just white. They didn't, they wanted Western Europeans. They did not want, they were upset about the people coming in from Italy, from Poland, from, you know, other European countries, the Eastern and Southern European mm-hmm. countries, even uh, reformed Jews who were here were disheartened by the, Eastern Jews who were coming in yeah. and they, and they wanted to combat that. So and then the, what happened was the eugenics, which was this fake science that they thought was real, uh, took hold, um, based on flawed premises and flawed science that's been completely disproven and created the scientific, uh, backing for all of their emotional, uh, n- desires to not, not that have these people in. Right. So here are some of the things that were written in the mainstream newspaper, the Boston Herald. Shall we permit these inferior races to dilute the thrifty, capable Yankee blood of the earlier immigrants? And the Yale Review described the vast masses of filth from every foul and stagnant pool of population in Europe. Um, In Century Monthly, an author informed readers that Mediterranean people are morally below the races of Northern Europe, that immigrants from Southern Italy lack conveniences for thinking that Neapolitans are a degenerate class infected with spiritual hookworm, displaying low foreheads, open mouths, weak chins, and backless heads. 
and that a few of the garment workers in the New York Union Square had the, quote, type of face that would find at a county fair in the West or the South. Um, and it goes on and on in this article by George Will um, from June 29th, 2019, titled in the Richmond Times Dispatch, Last Century's Immigration Debate Makes Today Seem Enlightened. And he ends with this fact. Um, uh, the canonical text of the immigration eugenics complex, Madison Grant's The Passing of the Great Race, is available today in at least eight editions and is frequently cited in the Internet's fetid swamps of white supremacy sites. At the 1946 Nuremberg Doctors' Trial, Nazi defendants invoked that book, as well as the U.S. Supreme Court's Buck v. Bell decision upholding state sterilization of, quote, defectives. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, a, eug a eugenics enthusiast, said... Three generations of imbeciles are enough, and America's Severely Restrictive Immigration Act of 1924. It is based on national quotas on 1890 immigration data before the surge of the, quote, motley throng. Okrent writes, these men didn't say they were following orders in the self-exonerating language of the moment. They said they were following Americans. Four years before the 1924 Act, 76% of immigrants came from Eastern or Southern Europe. After it did, 11% did. Some of those excluded went to Auschwitz. There, there's a there are, there are costs to public policy and the rhetoric that forms that public policy and that usually ends in the form of human lives. The story of the St. Louis. Have you heard right. the story there? They, I'm not. The, so there... They're, they got to the point where they were limiting how many people could get in. So they started having the ships who were bringing people over from Europe would basically sit offshore and wait till the first of the month and then have a race to get into the, um, into, into port. When the war started and the refugees started filing out of Germany, they were on this, there was this one boat called the uh, St. Louis. They were denied dock. They, they tried to get, um, Cuba to take and try to get these other countries to do it. They, everybody was trying to find a solution, but the one solution that they didn't want was come on in because you're fleeing this persecution. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually that ship was turned around and sent back to Germany, in which case a list of many of them that you can go search were all killed in concentration camps. Right. And the violence that happens in Central American countries, the South American countries, you hear the stories of the people that are coming here. When they go back, they're, you're sentencing them to die. Mm -hmm. So I think conservatives and, and closed border people really need to reconcile the fact with, A, people are never going to stop coming here. B, this is what closed borders look like. C, bureaucracy will always make this inefficient, and so people will be dying on American soil. Six children have already died in these detention facilities since September. And E, or wherever we're at, you're sending people back to die in their home country instead of staying in America, where in four generations and two generations, they, they, will be, uh, they will not be on the lower end of the poverty rung. They will be climbing the middle class ladder. They will be creating job opportunities. If you look at any of the data, going back to the utilitarian argument, Go look at any of the data from the Cato Institute about immigration, about the dreamers. If the dreamers left, for instance, it would, we'd lose like, I think it was $850 billion in economic revenue. Yep. Yep. Because as the labor supply increases, demand increases, and it, it's like when women entered the workforce and started competing for jobs in the, 19th, in the 20th century, you didn't see people, yeah, people competed for jobs, but new industries were formed like nonprofits, the healthcare sector expanded. As you increase the labor supply, the, the demand and supply keep up. And so you create because the people who come here are using as much as they're producing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you do have your bums who come here and suck off of California, but isn't that California's problem for having bad policy that doesn't work? Uh, so the argument against immigration overall you're just going to have to reconcile the fact that your policies are killing people. These are human beings. And I'm, and maybe the only way for a lot of these people to reconcile this is to deny their humanity altogether because they can't accept the fact that if I support this policy, 
children are going to die in custody and in, in their home country. It's a cognitive dissonance that leads them there. And you've got the, I've always said that you've got the people who are the real monsters behind the scenes who are mm -hmm. the really trying to push this we don't want those people here we don't want the wrong people here the same rhetoric that they were using back in the 1900s 1910s that henry cabot lodge was using in davenport and grant um, they that that language is still you still have people saying well they'll come here and vote socialist or whatever or they their um culture just doesn't mesh with ours we can't mm -hmm. have those pe those people from that culture and that was what they used to call racism racism in the 1910s 1920s because they considered that part of part of that language mm -hmm. uh so you've got those people then you've got the people who i consider the useful idiots mm -hmm. who buy into the propaganda who listen to it and are emotionally pulled by it to the point where they disconnect all of the stuff that counters everything that they're hearing because it's based on fear. It's based on uh, just a e lack of understanding. Self yeah. economic protection. Sure. Well, the $200 that I pay out of the $3,000 in taxes that actually goes to welfare, that's a line too far, you know? Yeah. Uh, Aaron, and I, I, I need to spend $300 for border security. So I don't lose that $200 out of my paycheck. Harry, what were you about to say? Oh, I'll just say, like, which it doesn't square with me is all these, because uh, a lot of the people are doing a lot of the pro-life crap. They all are about kids until they cross some imaginary line. And then the other thing, the aspect of, well, they're going to, they are taking, if they're coming in here, taking resources and jobs. And I say to you that if people who have the exact same thought was doing that when they created the internet and then want everyone to be connected you're basically that means you're just firewalling off the whole world and that doesn't that doesn't work yeah look at the look at the economic expansion from people being connected from from a, a greater sharing of knowledge for instance. right if mexico gets its stuff together it will become an economic superpower on the other side of the country. Guadalajara, GDL, is like a Silicon Valley of Mexico. Mm. There's a lot of government corruption up there that stops it from going anywhere. But if it got its crap together, like, no, it, it's a powerhouse. A lot of people from California would fleek, get the heck out of there and use GDL. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of great programmers and everything else in there because they're coming from Canada and other countries, but Mexico lets them sit there and work. And it takes them. Yeah, sorry. No, and also a lot of people will say um, that the, the they're coming here for economic reasons, not because of being in fear of their lives. It's not that dangerous in Honduras. And you can go back and listen to the episode that Hody and I did on Honduras and mm -hmm. you learn that it is considered to be one of the most dangerous places on earth mm -hmm. right now, including war zones. You're and more likely to die as a citizen in Honduras than an, a person in an active war zone. Now, I heard, wow. I heard a stat last night on the Chad Benson show, um, I think Greg Knapp was the guy who was hosting, and he says, well, in the last three or four years, the uh, crime rates dropped in half there. And I'm like, you're expecting that government to be telling you the right information? <laughs> right, the one bought off by the cartels. Or, but how do, how do, let me put on my John, still high. Let me put, <laughs> right, let me put on my uh, John Stossel hat, but Hody and Reinhold, <laughs> is it really our responsibility what happens in Honduras? The the Honduras who we um, the, the the term banana republic came from what the United States did to that country in the late 1800s early 1900s and continued to do through the fruit companies all the way up to the time when the drug war started to take place and we needed to stop the drugs coming in so then we started interfering there for that and in 2009 the State Department run by Hillary Clinton, so if you don't like Hillary Clinton, listen up, backed a coup in Honduras that turned that country from a positive trends of... of uh, human development. Yeah, human development just, uh, you know, it, it, it turned it all completely downward spiral within a year. And that's when the, the asylum seekers from Honduras increased here by 1,200%. Just from that 2009 to 2011, that's what was to 14. That all came from the direct result of us backing a coup there. Let's let Hody jump in here. Hody, I'm sure you have something to say. 
Tons. Now, look, let's say even if what Reinhold said wasn't the case, or you just think we're wearing tinfoil hats over here. Wasn't America supposed to be the place where you brought your huddled masses? Where you brought these poor people? Where you brought people who are down on their luck? This used to be a place where we said, oh, yeah, you down on your luck there? Well, come on in here. And so what we've done is we've designed a whole set of economic policies and systems that says, man, we used to be a place where huddled masses could, masses could come in and become individuals. And now look at, the, look at what we're doing. You're a huddled mass and we mass you together even further, right? You're, you're a bigger huddled mass. I mean, helicopter pictures of eight kids in the ground like sardines, right? Trying to huddle together to stay warm. You know, this is, this is, we're creating huddled masses instead. Even if you aren't, even if you say, well, that was Nixon or Kennedy, or they, it was their CIA that messed everything up in Honduras. Why should we pay the price today? Well, I'm not asking you to pay the price, but why would you have developed and support an economic system that encourages us to pay this price? To say, well, anybody who comes in, we got to pay for this way. They used to be nothing but a benefit. Here's the problem I have, and I don't want to get into borders like this, but here's the problem that I have, is if we say, you're allowed in the country, you people aren't allowed in the country. Do you trust a politician to do that? Do you trust them to do it well? If you're a closed border person, I will debate a closed border person. That's fine. I'm fine with a closed border libertarian. But if your closed borders look like this, you should be even louder than an open borders person, right? It's gross. Because this- it morally undermines your argument. It, it, it gives people like me the opportunity to say, this is what closed borders looks like. Right. And frankly, I'm sorry. This is what closed borders will look like. It will look like this. Right. You, and as long happens. as a politician is in, in control, they have no incentive to take care of these people. All right. Harry, Harry go ahead. Oh, yeah, because yeah, they want to do this whole, what are they talking about, like merit-based immigration and all this other stuff, or like Paul, stuff like that. And it's just, it's just gross. The, the idea that you know, the way technology is and the way markets are going that, you know, you, know, you can close this thing off. Right. And one thing, when, when we're saying that, um, I, keep, I keep hearing, you know, well, Australia is like this or Sweden or all these places have these really strict immigration policies. So, you know, why can't we? I'm like, well, weren't we supposed to be better than those places? Yeah. Weren't we supposed to be the number one best country in the world? Why don't we just take on all the other stuff from the Sweden and the Europeans and the Australians and everything else? They've got... Uh, healthcare, you know, Canada has got all the, the socialist healthcare. Why don't we do that if we're going to say, well, we can do their immigration too? Well, yeah, that not- thing doesn't support my preconceived biases. Yeah. It's also not like the United States has never taken on monsters and brought monsters in the country and benefited from taking in monsters. Well, part of the problem, again, going back to the drug war which if you want to end immigration, fight for better drug policy, fight for better foreign policy, mm-hmm. um, you, you crack down in the 80s on drugs, in the 70s and 80s, you crack down on drugs. <laughs> and communists. You drive into the prisons, specifically in places like L.A., a lot of El Salvadorans, Hondurans. And let's take the MS-13 and the El Salvadoran specifically. What you do is you end up creating gangs because the black gangs and the white gangs, all of a sudden there's this influx of Hispanics into prisons. And so they create MS-13. They serve their time and they're exported back to El Salvador. And then these people who have perfected criminality in American prisons, thanks to the American drug war and cracking down on victimless crimes, therefore creating violent criminals, are shipped back to their home country where they uh, continue in the drug trade and they apply their criminality to their home governments. They corrupt the government and life just continues to erode as more and more people are deported back. And so let's go back to the source of all of these problems. It is policy to begin with. Like I said, people need to ask, why is this happening? Instead of what are we going to do to stop it? Right. So let me let me close out before we close out. I want to I just want to get this in because I want to talk about the constitutional rights of illegal aliens and talk about some of the case law. So in decades spanning more than a century, the Supreme Court has ruled that the Constitution guarantees uh, that it applies its guarantees to every person within the borders, including aliens, quote, aliens whose presence in the country is unlawful. The 
quote, the government has the power to decide who let who it lets into the country and under what circumstances. But once here, even undocumented immigrants have the right to freedom of speech and religion, the right to be treated fairly, the right to privacy and other fundamental rights U.S. citizens enjoy. In a 1903 case called Yamada v. Fisher, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the INS, the Immigration Service, could not deport someone without a hearing that meets constitutional due process standards. Most people facing deportation are entitled to a hearing before an immigration judge and review, in most cases by federal court, representation by a lawyer but not at the government expense, reasonable notice of changes in a hearing's time and place, uh, a reasonable opportunity to examine the evidence in the government's witness, competent interpretation for non-English speaking immigrants, and clear and convincing proof that the government's grounds for deportation are valid. Now, many parts of the Constitution uses the term people or person rather than citizens. Those laws apply to everyone physically on U.S. soil, whether or not they're a citizen. Section 1 of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution says, No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protections of the law. Now, critics claim that undocumented workers or immigrants or migrants don't have legal rights, because they are lawbreakers by entering the country illegally and owed loyalty, no loyalty to the United States. They claim that only United States citizens, natural born or naturalized, are protected by the Constitution. I would say saying they have no loyalty to the United States, these are people who are paying uh, a year's salary or their entire life savings to be trafficked to the United States so they have a chance at uh, a new life. So the idea that... Um, they have no loyalty to the ideals of the United States, I think is far-fetched. I never have understood why we don't want those people here. You mean the Catholic, conservative, yeah. pro-life? They, they <laughs> certainly have worked much harder to be here than Jim Bob sitting in the trailer park in Greenville, North well, Carolina. Not invoke pejoratives. We're yeah. trying to convince people, not piss people off here. Paul. Exactly. Paul who looks like a Jim Bob, to be quite frank with you. Do the voice. Do it. No, okay, don't do it. Yes, don't do it. Do not right. do it. I don't know what voice you're talking about, friend. <laughs> <laughs> now, bad. James awful. Madison, a principal author of the Constitution and the fourth president of the United States, wrote, quote, that as they, aliens, owe, on the one hand, a temporary obedience, they are entitled in return to their constitutional protection an advantage. So James Madison, a founding, the man who wrote the Constitution, believed that they had constitutional protections and advantages. More recently, the United States Supreme Court ruled in 2001 that, quote, due process of the 14th Amendment applies to all aliens in the United States whose presence may be or is, quote, unlawful, involuntary, or transitory. Now, 20 years before Zadvedas, the Supreme Court ruled that the state of Texas could not enforce a state law that prohibited illegally present children from attending grade schools as all other Texas children were required to attend. The court ruled that, quote, the illegal aliens who are challenging the state may claim the benefit of the Equal Protection Clause, which provides that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Whatever his status under the immigration laws, an alien is a person in any ordinary sense of the term. The undocumented status of these children does not establish a sufficient rational basis for denying benefits that the state affords other residents. Now, in 1973, the court ruled that all criminal charge related elements of the Constitution amendments, the fourth, the fifth, the first, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the 14th, such as search and seizure, self-incrimination, trial by jury and due process, protect non-citizens legally or illegally present. In 1896, the court ruled that it must be concluded that all persons within the territory of the United States are entitled to protection by those amendments, the 5th and the 6th, and that even aliens shall not be held to answer for a capital or other infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment of a grand jury nor deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. So how do they work in practice? They have the right to due process. Uh, the Fifth Amendment states that no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness. So, you know, the, uh, I invoke the Fifth. Um, 
the issue of due process is at the heart of many immigration cases, including a 93 Supreme Court case that has returned to the spotlight with the surge in family separations. The case led to an agreement requiring the government to release children to their parents, a relative, or a licensed program within 20 days. In the ruling, Scalia wrote, it is well established that the Fifth Amendment entitled aliens to due process of law and deportation proceedings. Justice Scalia said that. But in reality, Andrew Arthur, a resident fellow in law and policy at the Conservative Center for Immigration Studies, quote, courts of law run the gamut. Uh, in some cases, immigrants are not granted a hearing at all. And when asked about the president's tweet, White House Press Secretary Sanders said uh, the process of expedited removal, which was created by the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 96, she said, just because you don't see a judge doesn't mean you aren't receiving due process. Under the <laughs> must have a different uh, definition of due process than they have of a different dictionary or something. Just because I beat you up doesn't mean I assaulted you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I said it out loud. Therefore, I'm I am the I am the law. Under the expedited expedited removal process, immigrants who have been in the country illegally for less than two years are apprehended within 100 miles of the border, can be deported almost immediately without going through a court hearing. The exception is asylum seekers who must be granted a hearing. Uh, in immigration court, you have very few rights. Uh, he said John Gibson, an immigration attorney. Guillaume says the bar for what constitutes evidence is lax in immigration court. Documents do not have to be authenticated and hearsay counts as admissible evidence. Hearsay is not allowed in most U.S. courts. In a majority of cases, it a lock solid 100% guaranteed conviction because there's little defense and most would confess they crossed the border illegally. Um, so you can continue to read uh, to the, about the right to legal counsel, the right to vote or hold office, the right to education, the right to unreasonable search and seizure, and many other things in our fantastic show notes by Sam Schultz that will be attached to this particular episode. So um, I really feel that we have, we have left a lot of people with very little wiggle room in terms of this issue. It's, it's just crystal clear that every child in American custody at the moment has a right to due process, a toilet, basic human rights. Uh, I, I don't know how you can possibly disagree with that fact. I think it's just unconscionable uh, that we would ever argue as a nation that children don't deserve to have clean facilities when they're being detained by, as wards of the state by the United States. I, I I can't understand why anybody would, but I'm sure there are people who will. So, yeah. this, this this is how the, uh, uh, the super bug is created that is immune to all freaking. Uh, no, <laughs> I think it's a great point. I this think is how it's created. The argument that we have to build a wall on national security to stop immigration is ludicrous when the re in reality the great national security risk is the amount of disease that is being just putting together, just yeah. put together by an intentional lack of care. Right. And, and then occasionally giving them that, and occasionally, so that bug is getting bigger and stronger because right. you're just occasionally giving them soap. Right. I'm just, just, oh, man, what is in there yeah. is probably... Inadequate medication. Like, right. here, here's a round of antibiotics mm -hmm. spread it amongst yourselves. Right. right. That's, that's, this is how this is created. This is, this is how. And what's the quote we've had in the chat recently? The uh, one third of the people. Oh, the Werner Herzog yeah, quote. That's it. Um, it, it. I love that quote. Let it's me find so, it real quick. The other question is like crossing the border illegally, misdemeanor or felony? Uh, it is a misdemeanor. Oh, okay. It cool. is. If, if you do not. And, apply for if you apply for asylum it mm -hmm. is not a crime oh. <laughs> if if it is considered a crime it's a misdemeanor uh, akin to getting a traffic ticket so i think we should be taking all the people who speed and let's put them in detention centers so here, and separate them from their so kids here, what has happened what has happened essentially is that six children so far have been given the death penalty for a misdemeanor that is crossing an imaginary line. <laughs> and that those are the ones in the detention centers. We saw the, the picture of the, the father and his daughter. You will never be able to convince me that someone deserves the death penalty for a misdemeanor, especially over something as absurd 
as crossing an imaginary line. It's ludicrous. Here, here is my thing. It is a misdemeanor. If you show up to traffic court and they can't process you in a reasonable amount of time, mm-hmm. they throw it out. Right. It's time to start letting these people loose because we can't process them in a reasonable time. If we want to try to issue them a summons for a later date and try to continue the case against them or continue their hearing, sure. Yeah, catch and release is a bad policy, according to Trump. But no, this, is, this, this is a worse policy. It, this, <laughs> yes, right. This, it, 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 let's not tap dance around it. It's fucking ludicrous right. to think that people are going to come back to their court date. I, I can well, see that point fully. If, if, but if they were to, potentially killing yeah, them is not a much yeah, better solution. Right. If they thought that they would actually get the asylum they're seeking, they'd come back in a heartbeat. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, they know that that's not going to happen. Right. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Immigration doesn't work because the government's in charge of it. What, what I love is when, when – because <laughs> yes, we, we're yes. talking about how these, these um, people are coming from Central and uh, South America. That they're basically conservatives. Why are they voting Democrat? Why, I wonder why they're voting Democrat. Maybe it's because the Republicans want to keep them out. They want to put them in detention centers. They want to basically torture them and don't care if they die. Mm-hmm. Why on the, earth would they want to vote Democrat? The Republican friends on their Facebook feed don't have a problem with babies not having diapers. Mm-hmm. Mm, I don't know why they would vote not vote well, yeah, for you. That doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. So final thoughts, Harry, final thoughts. Uh, just, yeah, it's – the conditions down there are just – it's just, it's just egregious. It's – we wouldn't – just like everyone has said, we wouldn't stand for that in anything. And it just, it is just awful that what's going on there. And, and it just shows you just the way they're just wiggling and just going after everything else. And it is, this, this is a slowly road because they're going to try to do this to these, um, these undesirables who are coming across that imaginary line. And, and they are doing it on American soil. And then they will just do it to something else. They'll find another group and they'll do it to that group until they get to the, you know, to who knows where this will end up to. And I was like, oh, he's making a slippery soap arch. Like, well, screw you. I am. And look what's happening. Look, look, look at the human cost of this. Slippery Honestly. Slippery. Yeah. Just the human cost of that. Right. Uh, throwing the cases out, getting these people out, getting them that. It is. Just because something's cliche, it doesn't mean that it's not true. Right. <laughs> Right. And it's not like the court system stuff like that doesn't have the ability to process this. They don't want to. Yeah. They don't want to process this. Because there's the, the same set of issues in these judges, the courts, these exist on the northern border, but they don't use them. And people cross these imaginary lines all day, every day. There's no, no one bothers you. Cross there, two to get here. Right. You cross, you just go through different towns, there's different like that. And to get about, there's school children that, there's school, I've talked about the school bus that goes across the Canadian American border every day. And a bus driver's got to get out and read everyone's passport, then get back in the bus to drive across it's the stupid absurd. border. It's absurd. Yeah. It's yeah. just like the, it's it is, ludicrous. And people are like, I don't Silly. understand what yeah. open borders looks like. I mean, look around you. We live in a country of open borders. 99 <laughs> borders between the continental U.S. 99 state borders. And then you add in every county, mm-hmm. township, township, city, it, individual houses. Yes. <laughs> you, yes. And within, <laughs> those, and within that, mm-hmm. you have governments. Republican governments that operate, but economically, the point is that economically we make it work. Right. Yeah. We have the technology, everything to make to make this work. Yeah. But the, you just got these people. You got people that don't want to make it work because yeah. they're afraid. They're afraid of an unknown, and they're meant to be. Af- and they are fed this information to so they feel afraid. So they're finding out and doing it on their own. Right. And it's like. And it, oh, sorry. And the other thing that really gets me when I want to finish this off is that. If given, there are probably, uh, I bet if giving the call out, there's probably tons of churches that would just let them bond. Like, cool, we'll be responsible. Can we have them? Can we have them, please? We'll take them. What? Give me 50. Give me 50. You know? Yes, we'll be responsible for the court date. Yes, if they don't do it, we'll pay this massive fine. Don't give, don't give crap. Get these people out of there. It is, that's, yeah, sorry. That's, I'm done. That's just awful. Reinhold? I was going to say the, People talk about the open border and you just can't stop anybody, right? So if I remember right, Virginia has an open border with the other states around it. And they've 
made it illegal for Richard Spencer to enter in that state. <laughs> so it seems like it's possible to do in an open border situation once due process has been given and you're not assuming that people coming over here are going to break the law or assuming that they're going to do this or, or do that without giving them due process. What happened to innocent until proven guilty? Right. Uh, and these people, they're considered guilty before and had to have to prove their innocence or prove their reason for being here is the reason being here is because they want to come here. I don't see why that's a big deal, but, um, but I guess for my final thought, just cause you know, I kind of jumped in here. Um, as your want to yeah, do. I, I, I kind of have a bit of a big mouth. Um, <laughs> read that book uh, by Daniel Krent. Uh, it's called The Guarded Gate. I'm re reading it for the second time. Mm. By reading, I mean listening to it. But it's uh, an exceptional book. It's very, very, very detailed. Written like a history documentary uh, just saga. Uh, with a lot of different players that were involved at the time and what they said at the time. It's not someone trying to put their opinion on what they think happened at the time. This is their own words, their own actions, their own deeds from the time uh, presented to you. And I, I really think it's a powerful book that when you hear it, you hear the same arguments being made then a hundred years ago as we're made, hearing being made now. Paul? I I try very hard not to uh, draw a line in the sand, but I think that if you Shh. do not... Harry's talking, sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I just tone it out. Uh, maybe that's... I'm that's sorry, Harry. Problem. That's why you're single. I, no, I, <laughs> no, that's probably from working with him. But uh, so, yeah, I... I try not to draw lines in the sand when it comes to libertarianism and dr drumming up a purity test. But if you do not believe in the universality of human rights, the individual I dignity of every being on earth, it's individual. Yeah, absolutely. Right. No, if you do not believe that every individual has rights and that includes the ability to not be wrapped in soiled cloth for months on end awaiting a show trial. I have to question why you're in this movement, why you think that you're a libertarian. I just think it's just a basic question of individual rights and individualism. Like yeah. it just, this is a fundamental core libertarian principle. Do you believe that a person has dignity and are deserving of not being abused by the people that have power over them. This is so simple to me. Absolutely. And I think that if you make any other case, you're betraying your libertarian principles. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you, I'm not for open borders. I'm not for closed borders. I just think like we should have a sensible immigration policy and people shouldn't be able to vote without a citizenship process. Like that's very reasonable. And I understand that. Right. Like what I don't feel is reasonable is that you're making the case that babies don't deserve medical care, that guards are intentionally neglecting children as to infect a population of people that they'd like to see die. I don't think that it's out of the realm of possibility that that is taking place. And I guess my final thought is that for the past six years since you helped get me into this party, I have strived to not form my own purity pissing test to judge others by but congratulations closed border callous libertarians you did it <laughs> you finally found my broken my breaking point right and it's because of a lack of humanity i think yeah. our liberty our brand of libertarianism here at we are libertarian is wrapped in the dignity of the individual and protecting the powerless and Sometimes that betrays itself in the form of conservative talking points, and sometimes that betrays itself in the form of liberal talking points, and other times everybody thinks we're nuts. But the core principle is that people deserve to be treated well by those in power, and also that probably the power shouldn't exist. Uh, Hody, final thoughts? 
conservatives, what's happened to your compassion? What do you hear as you hear those stories about children being returned to their parents dead or not being returned at all? What happens, when, what happens in your head and your heart when you hear that two thirds of our children, of these children, are sick? When you hear them passing around bacteria infested bottles, sharing lice combs, what's happened to you? What has happened to your heart and head? What kind of poison has entered your bloodstream that has made you think that this is okay? Your concept, true conservatives, is you want that little government. If, but, but border control might be one of those little things. Fine, fix it. If you're gonna have the mechanic fix your car, maybe he doesn't do a bang up job, but he sure as hell doesn't strap a bomb to it, right? We have a bomb being strapped to our car on the border. This is poison, this is intentional poison. This isn't an accident. Donald Trump is an economic genius. Yeah, we can argue the genius, haha, laugh at him all you want. Oh, it's funny because he's stupid. It's not true. He's graduated in schools and taking classes and courses on economy that would boggle most people's minds. And so he knows exactly what he's doing. This is terror. This is horror. This is designed to dissuade people from applying to immigrate to this country because they look at what legal immigration looks like. They look at what asylum looks like. And what we say is we want it to look like horror because we don't want you here. Cons libertarians who have adopted that, get off of the train. All right, I want some intellectual hon honesty from the libertarians right now. If you're a closed border person, fine. I'll debate you all day. I, I reached out and found two closed borders libertarians to write for the latest wall journal that we're talking about immigration. I will reach out to you and find you and publish you, fine. But your volume, about why we need border control better at least be as loud as it is on human dignity, human rights, right to privacy, first, second, and fourth amendments. It better at least be that loud. Because if it's not, you're intellectually dishonest. If you can look at this level of suffering and say, I will protect these rights and be really loud about it, but I'm really quiet over here. Okay, I get it. We don't wanna spend as much money uh, as we can on these, all right? Now, me being open borders, I don't have to deal with this issue at all. But if you're closed borders, if you say, ah, I want some security, fine. But you've got to look it over and say, I am okay with spending X amount of taxpayer dollars. This year, we are, uh, Jacob works for We're Libertarians. We're introducing a new line of uh, jet, jet fighters that will not be used or flown by anybody because they are inferior. We're still building them anyway. They will cost this country billions of dollars. Why? Because it's money spent. It's budgeted. We have to spend it so that they get the budget for next year. We have bad economic policies, but we are building billions of dollars worth of fighter jets that will go straight to a boneyard and never be flown by, by pilots because they're dangerous and inferior. If one thousandth of that money were spent on legal immigrants and human dignity, we would not be talking about this today. Find your compassion, be intellectually honest with yourself. If you're gonna support border control, make sure that you also support human dignity. Do not hear these stories and just say, yeah, but we need some. Condemn them. You can do both. That is not cognitive dissonance. You can defend reasonable immigration reform like Chris was talking about, voter citizenship, and, and, and compassion all at the same time. And just say, if we're going to have it, it needs to be transparent, it needs to be accountable, and it needs to be responsible. At the very least, if you're going to defend some amount of government libertarians, it must be that. Do not dismiss these stories of suffering, I beg of you. Because this party has lost a lot. We win battles, we lose battles. We cannot afford to lose the battle over human dignity because that is the only thing keeping us together. We lose and we lose and we lose, but at least we lose for the right reasons. And if we start losing because we wanna kick people out of this country or we're okay with our kids getting sick or life sharing combs or sleeping on concrete, we have lost our soul. I am fine with losing every political election till the end of time. I am not okay with losing my soul. These are the people we represent. Why do you fight?
This is why you fight. These kids sleeping on floors is why you fight. People with the flu spreading around is why you fight. This is the definition. This is the embodiment of what we are fighting against. Yeah, a little bit off your electrical bill there when we rag against the Department of, of Energy, sure. That's an important fight to have as well. But this is an in-your-face human rights violation that is killing and murdering people. It is intentional, and you need to be loud about it. Are you all happy you upset Hody? I, I very well said Hody. I think it is so true that this is like a watershed moment. And I think that you've completely nailed it because like not to invoke Godwin's law, not to go hyperbole. hyperbole. Let's read the Warner, Her Warner Herzog quote that we referenced earlier. Dear America, you're waking up as Germany once did to the awareness that one third of your people would kill another one third while one third watches. And I spent all of 2014, 2015 studying how does a society that is at the top of at the top of culture, essentially it was not a first world country at the time, but definitely, uh, uh, you know, a first world society. Um, economically the Weimar Germany was very rough, but how does, how does, Goebbels and Hitler and how do they turn the German society and I read books like Selling Hitler and the Richard Evans series and uh, one book stuck with me in, you know into the dark uh, it's called Into the Darkness and it's by uh, it's by a, a guy who ended up running one of the camps I think he was um, not Auschwitz, it started with an E. He, he ended up being in charge of one of the concentration camps. And the book is called Into That, Into that Darkness, An Examination of Conscience. And he reflects on how he could go from just a police officer in, a, in a, an Austrian town into running a concentration camp. And he talks about that evolution and the gymnastics in his mind that he had to to work out. And what I was so struck by in reading that story is how common he was and how plain he was and how banal he was and how he was just like all the rest of us. And then you, you read about how propaganda worked in Germany over many years, over 20 years to kind of get to a place where they could actually enact some very, uh, historically genocidal policies it was drip by drip by drip by drip by drip the shaping of public opinion from the end of world war one until the end of world war two and a lot of it was social proof it was people feeling that they couldn't go against the prevailing opinion and you know into that darkness talks a lot about how he he, you know, well, this seems like a thing to join and it might help me socially if I join this political party and, you know, all my friends are doing it. It's kind of a social club. And then, you know, then you eventually get to a place where like, I can't not do this and I have to do this and I have to make these choices because now my personal security and my, my I will be killed. Uh, it, it just evolves and it, and it changes over a long period of time. And what you study when you learn about the de-evolution of Germany into the Nazi regime, it scares the shit out of you <laughs> because you see that's us. And it's the Jordan Peterson argument of his examination of ordinary men about the men who make up the Einzelgruppen who went into uh, places like Czechoslovakia and Poland and other places to specifically, I think Czechoslovakia to kill Jews. And how could these ordinary men, like we think of Nazis as like these just like abstract figures, but these were cops and security guards and regular men who just had regular lives and families. And they were just kind of doing their job 
not unlike the people who work in in these detainment centers. You know, they probably go to church on Sunday and they go to the store and they go to the Kroger and buy groceries for their family and they love their kids. And then they go to the work and they don't allow a child to go to the bathroom. And, and it's because, I don't know, I just kind of went along and I have a good pension and, you know, I didn't want to cause a lot of problems. And we've seen this over the course of We Are Libertarians as we've tried to tell the story of the human cost. And I learned an important lesson in episode 91 when we talked to Woody about the death of his daughter, Rachel, in the Indiana prison system, uh, which is a very relevant episode to this as well life sentence, basically a, a death sentence for selling two Oxycontin because her boyfriend didn't want to get out of uh, off the couch or whatever, ends up in prison with a rare blood disease. Bureaucracy means that she's not able to be treated in a proper way. And she ends up bleeding out and hemorrhaging. And we go through the whole process of how the Indiana prison system hid her from Woody and from her family, obscured how she died. Uh, and one guy finally grew a conscience and called Woody and said, your daughter's in this facility and you need to come see her tonight because she's not going to make it till the morning. A hundred people touched that story. A hundred people watched Rachel dying for months. And they just didn't say anything because it's just not my place. It's just not my job. I need to protect my income. I have a kid, I have a kid in school. And so what Hody's saying is very true. You have to start speaking up. If you've been moved by this episode, if you have found that you can't, like Hody, it's hit your conscience in a way that you can't stay silent. You shouldn't stay silent. Don't let the fear of other people, don't worry about causing a fight on your Facebook feed. People need to see what is happening. People need to hear the beginning of this episode so they understand the human cost of this policy. It's just imperative because the more... <laughs> Silence is consent, remember. <laughs> uh, but it is the truth. When people are afraid of speaking up and saying this is wrong because they don't want to be judged, eventually the conscience of the nation erodes into a place where children can piss themselves and nobody cares. In fact, we're arguing for it because they're others. That's a dangerous place for our society to be. And you listening have the choice to speak up about it, call your congressman, share photos, video, this content, any of the show links and just say no, but look, and that's all you got to say is look, do you think children deserve toilets? And I'm sure that at various points, people have been really pissed off, not at what's happening, but pissed off at us. That's a really good sign because that's your conscience pricking you. And it's saying, I know, I know what I believe is right, and I know that they're wrong, but I don't know how. Or I'm being challenged, and I'm pissed off about it because I don't have an answer. The things that made you mad, go back and study it. You may be wrong. That's how I became a libertarian, frankly, is because I was arguing Rush Limbaugh talking points to a very smart uh, group of people, and I realized I didn't know what I believed. And this podcast has been a long conversation with myself about what I actually believe. And, uh, you know, it's just really important not to let this pass because it's worse than it was a year ago. It's going to be worse in a year. It's not going to be six kids. It's going to be 25 kids and then it will be a hundred kids and then it will be a thousand kids. And well, how many more kids how many deaths for a misdemeanor is acceptable? I mean, if your kids committed a misdemeanor, they steal a chocolate bar from the local grocery store, would you want your kids to be locked up in that kind of facility? 
Why is the morality different? Because they're not from your country or they're being held by the government. In my mind, none of the morality changes, but you have to do whatever mental gymnastics you need to do. So um, I want to thank our patrons, uh, Christy Avery, Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, uh, the Libertarian Coalition, intern Ed Brehob. Thank you guys for being our $100 a month contributors. Uh, we thank everybody for listening to this episode. I want to thank Harry and Reinhold and Paul and Hody for being with us. It's been a very long night. We've done about four hours tonight. Um, and I hope that you enjoy it. And uh, I hope that you learned something or that you thought about things in a different way. And if you did, we always ask you to share and help others to see things in a different light as well. So until then, we say uh, have a good week and we'll talk to you next Tuesday.